My name is Jessica Stanich, and this is my interesting case. I have a seven-month-old male with reported history of vomiting. He's accompanied by his father. He's immunized. He's had a couple of episodes of vomiting today, had to come home from daycare. He's had no formula today, more vomiting once he got home, non-bloody, has felt warm. Now, really, Dad's concern is that he's really not interactive anymore. Denies cough, difficulty breathing, diarrhea, any dark or bloody stools, and no reported history of trauma. He has had decreased number of wet diapers today. So at this point, um, dad's holding the child on his chest and he's sleeping and he looks really comfortable. Um, but so I, at this point, I'm going to initiate my examination. So I ask the father if I can pick him up. And as I pick him up, he's completely and totally limp, um, really concerned about whether he's even responding to me. So I immediately grab my consultant. We get some vitals, really just tachycardia is his only abnormality. Get him on the monitor and start looking for IV access. A responsive disternal rub um, kind of arouses a little bit, but really, really, really lethargic. So physical exam-wise, really completely normal other than this lethargy. Um, my neuro exam is normal. He's got normal tone. His abdomen is soft. Um, he does respond to some painful stimuli, but not really necessarily purposefully. He looks really... Uh, really, really lethargic, as I've said, um, and no other physical exam findings. So here we have this very lethargic infant with this reported history of vomiting. Tachycardia, some subjective fevers, but nothing documented, and a really otherwise normal physical exam to go with. Um, again, it's lethargy that I'm really concerned about at this point. So what's our differential diagnosis for this altered mental status in, in a kid his age? Did he ingest something? Has he gotten into dad's medicine cabinet? Has he been poisoned at all? Is there any history of abuse or trauma? Is he infected? And this is a septic picture. Does he have urinary tract infection? I mean, I have no nothing on my lung exam or my abdominal exam. Is he encephalopathic because of some metabolic disorder? Is this this inborn error of metabolism we keep hearing about where you need to worry about the kid's ammonia and we just haven't picked it up yet? Is he hypoglycemic? Um, is there an electrolyte abnormality? Is there some endocrinopathy that we haven't, haven't picked up on? So really, really concerning. Very, very broad differential diagnosis at this point. Again, lethargic and vomiting. We order uh, various tests, really broad net. Head CT, concerns for trauma, an x-ray of his abdomen, labs for a point of care glucose, um, CBC lights, some abdominal labs, that ammonia concern for the inborn error of metabolisms and blood cultures, given he has had this uh, reported history of fevers, even though he's not febrile here. So of course, we're trying to obtain IV access at this point, and, and it's challenging because we need it. Um, we get enough blood on, on one of the sticks to get a point of care glucose, and we know that's normal. Um, and uh, the young boy sent, is sent to the CT scanner for his head CT. We sort of step back away and reevaluate this differential diagnosis because this kid, you know, he looks sick. So his CT is negative. The initial um, bolus is, is running. Um, he's starting to perk up just a little bit, so I go in to reexamine him. And again, still very lethargic. But as I'm, I'm reexamining his belly, he kind of perks up a little bit and starts vomiting right there in front of me. So I step out of the room, we're reevaluating this differential again. And Dr. Helmick, one of our peds docs, says, Hey, have you thought about interception? And of course, we order the abdominal ultrasound, and that's exactly what he had. Um, we have on the left side of the screen the cross section of the uh, of the interception here, with that telescoping of the small bowel, um, and on the right we have the long axis view, um, which clinches our diagnosis. So, what do you do now? Ninety percent of these interceptions are re do not reduce spontaneously. And so you worry about, is this uh, kid, does he have peritonitis? Is he in shock? Is he dehydrated? So the treatment really initially for our standpoint is fluids, 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 fluids. If he's not in shock, there's no peritonitis, he doesn't have sepsis, and there's no signs of perforation, you can proceed with a non-operative management with a pneumatic reduction, hydrostatic reduction, or even a contrast enema. But in the meantime, what's really, really important is that you call your ped surgeons immediately and let them know that this kid is here, that he has interception, that you're attempting to reduce it um, with a non-operative approach, but that if this is unsuccessful, you're going to need their help. So if post-reduction um, management, what do we do afterwards if it's successful and he doesn't need surgery? Um, usually you admit for observation, but there's some new studies out there that say maybe we don't need to. Um, there is a recurrence risk uh, in the first 24 to 48 hours, which is what has um, led us to this admission, but this new data is showing maybe not. 
So the situation here is it's a retrospective chart review um, background. Rate of recurrence, there was a significant difference between the discharge group and the hospitalized group, but only two patients in each group required surgical intervention. Our assessment, it does not increase morbidity if we discharge them. It can be safely managed as an outpatient with reliable follow-up, so maybe we should consider that. So what happened to our little boy? He um, continued to be quite lethargic. We did attempt to reduce it non-operatively with reduction enema. Tried it the first time, it was unsuccessful. He was returned back to our unit. We continued to hydrate him with IV fluids, was sent back for a second attempt. That reduction was unsuccessful and ultimately went to the operating room. So what is intussusception? It's telescoping of the proximal bowel into the more distal bowel, causing obstruction, ischemia, and necrosis. Peak age of onset is usually between five and nine months, but it can happen anywhere between three, and six, three months and six years. It's usually idiopathic or caused from lymphadenopathy. Um, so clinical presentation is really age-dependent. You have this classic triad that we all read about in textbooks about, with abdominal pain, vomiting, and these bloody uh, stools, and that's actually not as common part of the presentation. This lethargy with this intermittent colicky abdominal pain is actually way, way more common. You have these long periods of lethargy, and the kid wakes up just like mine did. What's the workup? Labs are really not helpful, but if you're casting a broad net because you don't know what's really going on, you're probably still going to order them. And imaging, abdominal x-ray, I think is something we used to do in the past. It has poor sensitivity and specificity, but ultrasound here is the most sensitive and most specific, almost 100% for both. It is the gold standard. So in summary, if you have a lethargic vomiting infant, you need to think about intussusception. You need to get an abdominal ultrasound quickly because time is bowel. You need to call surgery before you need them. Um, if the reduction is successful non-operatively, um, they may be admitted, but it may be also safe to discharge them home. And if it's unsuccessful, they're going to the operating room for, for surgery.